Well, good morning, a warm welcome to you. Uh, if you're visiting us, it's great to have you with us. A really warm welcome to you. And um, uh, let me just run through a few notices before we begin the service. Uh, if you do need the fire exits, um, the door on your left uh, is one of them, through the, the hallway, out onto the street, or the door behind me um, goes out through the alleyway, down onto the street. The meeting point's down the road on Calverley Walk. Um, do stay for drinks after the morning service. They'll be served in the foyer. Um, this evening, our service is usually at 6.30, and uh, I'm really grateful to David for his support for preaching this evening. That's really appreciated. Um, so David will be preaching... Um, unscheduled this evening, which is uh, great. So, so do come along this evening for the first portion of James chapter 4. Um, the notices this week are largely standard things. So Tuesday morning will be um, the series on the upper room uh, taking place in the side hall. Um, that's Sinclair Ferguson's video series. That's at 10 o'clock. And then uh, not on the screen, but just to, for your prayers, um, there'll be a service at St. Margaret's on Tuesday afternoon, a care home service. Um, is there Dolly House this week? There is. Well, Dolly House. Okay, I'm getting a yes and a no. Okay, there's a conversation that needs to happen after this. <laughs> Good, okay, I'm glad I mentioned that. Good. So a couple of a couple of uh, care home services that's happening this week then for your prayers. Um, the prayer meeting will be Tuesday evening at uh, 7.30 as usual in the side hall. Um, tracting God willing, 10.15 Thursday, starting at Banker's Corner. Um, and the ladies' coffee morning as usual will be in the side hall at 10 o'clock on Thursday till 11.30. Uh, Friday football at 9.15, and uh, just a, then a few things uh, additional to what we uh, normally go through. Um, the, f- the shoe bags project, the shoe bags project, for those that don't know, is to do with uh, Christmas gifts for children in Sierra Leone. Um, uh, we've just had it, the, the shipment of those, well, just, it, it was not just, is it, December now, it's a long time ago, but uh, it was good to see photos of that um, uh, from Sierra Leone. Uh, so the project uh, is uh, building steam again this year. The first shoe bags sewing session of the year will be on the Saturday, the 24th of February. She'd appreciate uh, knowing who, who's going. Um, uh, also, uh, we are now collecting donations of goods for the shoe bags, and so the details of those are in the porch. Uh, so, so do see what's needed um, for the current month, uh, and that will change month by month. Um, I'll be on annual leave this coming week from Wednesday to next Sunday. That's just to let you know. So we have a visiting speaker next Sunday uh, morning. I think it's um, Hugh. Oh, off the top of my head, I can't remember his surname. Yes, sorry, it's, it's, it's eluded me. Um, fr- from St. Thank you, Hugh Larrys. Thank you, yes, from um, St. John's in Polgate. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, uh, yeah, here's an interesting one for you. Um, it, 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 this is a call for help, basically, for anyone who's vaguely tech-savvy. Um, <clears throat> we'd really like to back up our YouTube archive, which is, um, what, 600-odd sermons? So we'd like to, to have a, 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 a backup of that that's, that's sort of safe, as it were, that's not going to um, uh, come under any change of policy from YouTube or anything like that. So, um, so basically, it's not difficult. It's just very tedious. It's just one by one. We've got to download 600 sermons. Or, or, so, so if we can share that out, that obviously makes it easier. So if you're interested in doing that uh, and would, would be interested uh, to, to um, just let me know, and uh, it's not difficult, just just time-consuming. So that would be really helpful. And finally, Evelina, Vasya, and Damaris will be uh, returning home tomorrow. Uh, it's been really good to have you with us, and uh, we've, we've enjoyed it. Uh, we'll, we, I don't know when the next time we'll see you, but the Lord knows, and uh, we look forward to whenever that is. It's been really good. Great. Well, we'll be praying for Evelina and Vasya and Damaris as they return to Moldova um, later in the service. Let's begin our worship, though. A couple of verses from Colossians, Colossians 2, verses 6 to 7. Say this, for our encouragement as we uh, come to the Lord to worship him this morning. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. For those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ, who love him, uh, who, who trust in him for the forgiveness of our sins, We've come here this morning to worship God, and we've come here this morning to be built up in our faith in Christ, to increase in our thanksgiving. And so that's what, uh, God willing, we pray will take place this morning as we meet in his name. Let's come to God in prayer then, shall we? Let's pray. 
Oh, Heavenly Father, we do indeed gather this morning in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, your Son, whom you love, whom you sent into this world to be the Savior of the world, to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You sent your beloved Son to the cross out of unspeakable grace and mercy towards sinners so that whoever repents and believes will be saved, will have eternal life, will be your children, will be gathered to you ultimately into the unadulterated joy of the world to come when you will be present with your people. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would build up your people in Christ this morning. We pray that we would do business with you this morning. We pray that we would earnestly seek you. We pray now that you'd send us your Holy Spirit. We pray that our singing would not be merely with our lips, but with our hearts. We pray that uh, by the end of our time together at least, that we would be overflowing with thanksgiving for your Son and all that he's done for us. That we'd be built up in him and equipped for the week ahead. And Father, we pray if it's your will that you'd send your spirit to new ground this morning. We pray that you would call people to eternal life in Christ. We pray that you give people new birth, doing that work that only you can do in hardened, spiritually dead people. Heavenly Father, bless us today, we pray. We are weak, but you are almighty. And so we come to you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our first sing, uh, song together then. Come people of the risen King. Let's stand and sing this.
I'd like to turn your Bibles to um, Mark chapter 5. It's on page 840 in the Church Bibles. Mark chapter 5. And there's a, there's a story here I'm just going to read the ending of. It's, it's, the, it's from verses 1 to 20 is the whole story. Um, Jesus healing um, a man with, with a demon. This, this demon-possessed man is completely out of control, completely wild. He's a menace. That They try and chain him. They can't even do that. He breaks the chains. It's a complete disaster, this man. And yet, uh, because of all the demons that, that he has in him. Uh, but, but Jesus deals with those demons. Uh, he sends them away. Uh, he sends them into the pigs, if you know the story. And, the, and they rush down into the, into, the, into the lake. But I just want to look at the end of the story, because it's, it's really uh, remarkable and beautiful. So I'm going to read from verses 14 to 20. The herdsmen, that's the people who've been looking after the pigs, fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who'd had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. And as he was getting into the boat, that's as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who'd been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he, Jesus, did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. The ending of that story is just so rich in itself. You, you, can, you can do all sorts of, uh, you can show all sorts of things. There. You can show the deity of Christ there. But I'm not going there this morning. I just want to show the contrast between the two beggings. The people who live in that area, they beg Jesus to go away. But the, the man who's saved from these demons begs the opposite. He begs to be with Jesus. And I just love that. This man who's been saved by Jesus, this man who's, who's been freed from all these things that bound him and shackled him and, and made his life an absolute misery and everyone else's life a misery, he's been freed from those things and now he begs to be with Jesus. And I just love that. And I think it shows us several things. It shows us that the heart of a person uh, who's being saved doesn't just want Jesus' stuff, doesn't just want Jesus' blessings, doesn't just want eternal life and forgiveness of sins. They want Jesus himself. So this is actually a, a mark of a believer. A mark of a believer is someone who loves Jesus, whose heart's been turned, who doesn't just want Jesus' blessings, but who want Je wants Jesus himself. And so salvation actually... Having eternal life is having Jesus. There's a verse in John's, uh, 1, 1 John, John's letter, John's first letter that says this. 1 John 5 verse 12. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So it's not a case of, you know, you have forgiveness of sins or not. If you have Jesus, you have everything. You have forgiveness of sins. You, you're a child of God. You've got an eternal inheritance. It all depends on whether you have Jesus. It all depends on whether you love Jesus. If you have Jesus, you have eternal life. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have life. And I was actually sat thinking about this by, by um, a verse I thought I was going to be preaching on today, but actually I'm not going to quite get there, from John 11, which is where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He doesn't say, I give resurrection and life. He does, but he doesn't say that. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. You see, if we have Jesus, we have resurrection, we have life. It all depends on whether we have Jesus. It all depends on whether we love Jesus. Do you love Jesus? Some of you are responding in your hearts, yes, I do. I love Jesus. Like this man, you're responding because you know Jesus has saved you. And you love him for that. And you're looking forward to being with him forever. For you, heaven isn't just about being in a place of, of brightness and, 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 and no problems. It's about being with Jesus. That's what it's all about. That's what the Christian faith is all about. It's all about Christ. This man was loved by Jesus, saved by Jesus, and now he loves Jesus and wants to be with him. Is that your story? If not, then ask Jesus to make it your story. 
We're going to sing again. We're going to sing. At your feet we fall, mighty risen Lord. That's exactly what this man did. And we're going to metaphorically do that as we worship the Lord together as we sing this. Let's come to God in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, like that man freed from all those legion of demons, we want to come and bow this morning at your feet and at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ who sits at your right hand in glory. We want to worship and adore you We want to tell you that we love you. At the same time, confessing that our love is so poor and meager and we pray that you would grow our love. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this salvation that we have in the gospel. We thank you for the majestic gospel that straddles the whole of history, saving people, saving people from every nation, from every language, bringing people to that final gathering where there will be unhindered worship of of God, unrestrained joy in our Saviour. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for these things. We pray that today you would stir our hearts in worship and thanksgiving and adoration. We pray that you would use your word today to minister to us, that you'd send us your Holy Spirit, that you cause us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, 
that you cause us to be rooted and built up in Christ and established in the faith and abounding in thanksgiving. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would do these things for us this morning. And Father, we pray for this church. We pray for us to be bold witnesses to the Lord Jesus and to the gospel. Heavenly Father, many times we fail you in this. Many times we we fail to testify to the grace of God when we have a, a prompting to do so. Just make us faithful and bold witnesses to Christ and to the gospel, we pray. Father, we pray for your grace and mercy to be poured out on our nation. We pray for revival to come in our time. We pray for revival to come in the countries of the West. We pray for the nation of Moldova as well. We thank you for the visit of uh, 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 um, Evelina and the family. and uh, we, We thank you for that and pray for their country too, that they would see your spirit poured out in their nation. Father, we pray for our nation and its king. We think of our king with the diagnosis of cancer that he's uh, made public this week. We pray for our king. We pray that he would acknowledge Jesus as king of kings and lord of lords and that he would know this salvation for himself and that he would personally, out of joy at the forgiveness of his sins in Christ, acknowledge Jesus Christ as lord and saviour. So we pray for our king. We pray for our government too. And Father, we rejoiced a few days ago that the abortion amendment to the criminal justice bill had been dropped and now has been reintroduced by another door. And so, Father, we just pray for that evil, wicked amendment never to make our statute books, never to become law. Father, we pray you protect the unborn in our nation. Father, we rejoice that even here this morning we have two at least unborn children in our midst and we thank you for that and we pray that the laws of our nation would protect the unborn so we pray for just government in this issue we pray for the elections that will be coming up um, this year we pray that you'd overrule for good and in mercy and give us the the government that we need rather than government that we deserve and father we do pray for Evelina and Vasya and Damaris as they fly home tomorrow back to Moldova. We thank you that they have been with us these last two weeks. We thank you that after a number of years of not seeing them, and for um, many who have well, ne- never seen Varis, uh, Vasio Damaris at all before, we thank you for them being in our presence. Thank you that they were here for, they've been here for two Sundays, and we've been able to enjoy worshipping with them for these two Sundays. And so we, we just pray your blessing on them. We thank you for your work in their life. We thank you that you saved Evelina, though she was not from a Christian background. We thank you that you saved Vasya, though he was not from a Christian background. We thank you that you brought them together. And we thank you for your, uh, the family that you are giving to them. And we pray your blessing on Damaris and the other little one who's not yet born, that they would know Christ, their Savior, from an early age, that they rejoice in Christ, even as John the Baptist rejoiced in Christ while he was still in the womb. May these two children rejoice from an early age, we pray in knowing Christ as their saviour. And we pray for their ministry in Moldova. We pray that you would bless um, Vasya in his ministry at, at OM and, and um, Evelina as she supports him in, a, in the things that she's able to do uh, as and when, with, with a, being a full-time mother at this time. So we, we, we just pray your blessing on, on their work, on their ministry, on their family life. We pray you'd meet all their needs uh, and we pray that you would protect them as they go back. We pray for uh, even just the the day of travel tomorrow, which could be so arduous, changing flights at Istanbul uh, with a little one. And and we just pray for for all of that to go very smoothly. Just make their path straight for them to arrive safely back home tomorrow evening, we pray. And then may they and we, though we won't see each other for some time, no doubt, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. We're going to have our portion of John's Gospel read uh, shortly, but we're going to uh, sing first that the Lord would speak to us as as it's read to us and and as it's preached. So we're going to stand and sing this, and then after that we'll turn to John. Thank you.
So we'd like to turn your Bibles to John chapter 11. It's on page 897. John chapter 11. Eunice has handed over Ellie, so she's ready to read it. We're going to read actually the whole of this um, uh, episode from verses 1 to 44. I won't be preaching on the whole of it. I'm going to try and cover this over the course of uh, at least two sermons. Uh, So we'll be just sort of dabbling in the edges of it today, it feels like. But it's worth hearing the whole story because it is a majestic story. So let's hear this from the Bible from Eunice. Thank you. John chapter 11, verse 1 to 44. That's on page 897 in the Church Bibles. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. So, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? 
So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he, said this, when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. This is an amazing and wonderful passage, isn't it? And I hope you got a sense of that um, as it was read um, just now. And isn't it amazing that it, it, it narrates nothing of the reaction of Lazarus's sisters? It leaves that entirely to our imagination, and, and probably because it couldn't be put into words. I mean, how do you put into words when someone who's been so desperately uh, uh, sad about their, their brother uh, their beloved family member, uh, and has them back from the dead. Uh, it, it cannot be put into words, can it? And so um, John just leaves that to our imagination uh, to, to, to sort of picture, as it were. It leaves us to imagine the gasp. Can imagine you know, the, the stones roll back, the first movements are seen from within the grave. Imagine the gasps. I mean, you probably sent people running. And then as, as Lazarus's face is, is revealed from behind the the, the face shroud, and they see that it's not grey, it's not dead, it has the colour of life, it's not even ill. It's got the colour of life to him again. They, they rejoice in that. They were surely beside themselves. And so the text doesn't need to describe those things. It was beyond description. But actually something of Mary and Martha's joy and adoration of Jesus is found in this passage. In fact, it's found quite early on in the text, in verse 2. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. Now this is actually referring forwards to chapter 12, beginning of chapter 12, where Martha and Mary, Lazarus' sisters, hold a dinner in honor of Jesus. Jesus is there at that dinner. Lazarus is there at the dinner. The one who has been in the grave, he's back from the grave, back to life again. He's at that dinner in beginning of chapter 12. And at that meal, Mary pours out costly ointment on Jesus' feet, and she wipes his feet with her hair. And she's, she's quite literally pouring out her love and devotion to this one who's been so powerfully gracious to her family. And so I think this is surely at least part of the glorifying of God and the glorifying of the Son of God that verse 4 speaks of. You see verse 4? When Jesus heard that um, Lazarus was ill, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified in it. The Son of God is glorified uh, in uh, in a number of ways, one of which is by the the adoration that wells up in Mary's heart and Martha's heart as a result of what happens to their beloved Lazarus. And so my prayer is this morning that Christ will, as it were, um, be glorified in the same way in our midst as we look at this passage together, as we just paddle in the edges of the passage, actually. We're not going to deal with some of the core central themes of resurrection. We're going to be looking at the edges and come back to it again another time. But as we, even as we do that this morning, my prayer is that um, Christ will be glorified in the rising of our hearts in devotion and love to him as we look at this passage together. Now, one thing we need to make sure relatively uh, early in, in, in this sermon is that the passage is narrating history. I described it before Eunice came up. I said it's a story. It is a story. But it's not just any old story. It is a historically accurate story. It is given to us as actual history that happened physically in a Middle Eastern graveyard. Now, many people reject the possibility that such miracles happened, could happen, did happen. I was speaking to someone this week, actually. Bizarrely, he, was, uh, he, he, he reads the Bible. He reads the Bible in church even. I think even this very morning, he's reading about the transfiguration of Jesus. He doesn't believe it happened. There are many people, and the sad thing is, not just are there many people who reject um, the miracles in the Bible, but there are many people who call themselves Christians. 
who reject these things that are written in the Bible and say that they didn't happen. And so I just want to really sort of put this marker down that that, that, that is absolutely not the case. It's absolutely nonsense that we can, to think that there's any spiritual benefit for, from, from disbelieving what's written in the Bible. Now, do you remember chapter 10, verse 37? This is really helpful. Chapter 10, verse 37, Jesus said, If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. In other words, if Jesus is not doing the works of God in our passage, Jesus says, don't believe him. The Christian faith really is grounded and rooted in history. It's not just floating in some airy, fairy, fairy tale land of of sort of, you know, spiritual mist and nonsense. It's grounded in history. It narrates to us actual physical, historical miracles that Jesus did, and of course the resurrection of Jesus himself as a historical fact. The whole of John's Gospel is framed with the great truth that the Word became flesh, the one whose God came and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. It's not possible that John's gospel is uh, attempting to narrate lies to us or anything like that. It's truth. And of course, the one who is the story of John's gospel is the one who came from God, full of grace and truth. And so we should expect him to do the supernatural and the miraculous. So there's no way we're to take this passage as anything other than a plain historical account of what actually happened. And it's not gullible to believe this. You know, some people think it's gullible. No. Apostle Paul actually says in Acts 28 verse 6, uh, sorry, 26 verse 8, why should it be thought incredible that God raises the dead? That's not hard to believe, is it? If there's a God and he is majestic and powerful, why is it hard to believe that he raises the dead? This is what we're seeing in our passage. We're seeing God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, raising the dead actually physically historically and so that's what he does he physically literally historically raises a dead man to life again now what we're going to look at this week actually is the subject of the love of jesus that's in this passage we're going to come back another time god willing to look at the central themes of resurrection and new life and and the power that jesus exerts and the saying that he gives in uh, verses 25 and 26 Uh, we'll look at those another time what we'll be looking at mostly this morning is the first 16 verses uh, with a few other bits as well from later in the passage and, and the, the, the context as well, uh, uh, slightly uh, uh, the broader context of John's Gospel. But the love of Jesus is the thing that we'll be looking at this morning from this passage. The love of Jesus, let me just show you that it's a theme that runs through the passage then as we start. Verse 3. So the sisters sent to him, sent to Jesus, a message saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Jesus loved Lazarus. It was well known. And so uh, that's the love of of Jesus for Lazarus is clear there. Verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And then verse 36. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. That is, see how Jesus loved Lazarus as Jesus weeps at Lazarus' tomb. Now there's an obvious link between the love of Jesus and the miracle, the, the miraculous sign that takes place in the passage. Jesus does this miraculous sign out of love. That's clear and obvious, isn't it? Out of love for Lazarus and out of love for his sisters, verse 5. But there are some surprises to the love of Jesus in this passage. And I want to just draw those out because I think these are helpful for us to look at, helpful for us uh, in the circumstances that you may be going through as a believer. And I know some of you are going through very difficult times at the moment. And so let me just draw out some helpful things, I hope then, for us to see about the love of Jesus from this passage. Verses 5 and 6. Let's look at this first of all. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and, and Lazarus. So... When he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two longer, two days longer in the place where he was. I read that very badly. I'm going to read it again. Verses 5 and 6. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that, Je- that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. There's a word so there right in the middle of these two verses that links verse 5 and verse 6. The NIV unfortunately has the word yet as though Jesus loved them uh, but even so, uh, 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 but, there's no but there. It's, it's a so, it's the therefore. 
And it seems strange, doesn't it? Because, it's saying, because Jesus loved Martha and Mary, he stays put two days before he goes to Lazarus. So in other words, there's a reason for Jesus' delay, and it stems precisely from Jesus' love that he delays. Not in spite of, as the NIV might sort of lead us to believe, no, it's because of his love that he delays. But it seems like the opposite, doesn't it? I mean, just listen to Martha and Mary's words. In fact, the first words that they, they greet Jesus with when he does get to Bethany, to, um, to Lazarus' um, town. Verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If only you'd got here sooner is the idea. What a shame you didn't. And we get exactly the same words uh, uh, in verse uh, uh, 20, uh, sorry, 32. Mary uh, says almost, almost exactly the same words to Jesus. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But it seems like the opposite, doesn't it? So both of them lament the fact that Jesus was not there sooner. Now, how would they have felt if they'd known that Jesus had deliberately delayed going to Lazarus? How would they have felt? They may have felt that Jesus didn't love them by delaying. And yet it was precisely the opposite. Now, this is so helpful for us. Are you a believer in Jesus like Martha and Mary? And you experience painful things in this life and as I look out in your faces I, I can I know the answer for some of you is yes I know some of you are going through exactly that painful things and you're a believer in Jesus Christ and yet what we're seeing here is that Jesus' love and those painful things are not incompatible they go together. They go together. Maybe some of you are tempted to think that something's gone wrong. Maybe some of you are tempted to think, have I, have I gone astray? Well, we do sometimes go astray, and the Lord does sometimes put us under discipline for a time. Yes, that's true, he does, for our good. But even that's out of love. But maybe some of you are thinking, well, something's gone wrong. Jesus stopped loving me. All these things are, 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 are besetting me, and, and, and my life's just a mess and, and it's not what it was and everything's wrong where's the love of Jesus in this where's the love of Jesus that I committed my life to that I love for, for salvation and yet I seem to be struggling it can feel like that can't it it can feel that the love of Jesus has abandoned us but you see here if you're a believer even those circumstances are because of Jesus's love now we need to understand what what's going on here why did Jesus out of his love delay going to Lazarus and the answer is, so that the sign Jesus did, the miraculous sign Jesus did, was all the greater. So that the display of Jesus' glory in the eyes of, of both believers and non-believers was all the greater. I heard uh, one of you put it like this this week. God stacks the odds against himself. And he does. God stacks the odds against himself so that when he acts, it's all the greater for it. And, all the, uh, and shown to be all the greater for it. And so think of... Uh, the water that's poured on Elijah's sacrifice at Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18. It's so that the display of God's, God's glory is all the greater, so that when fire from heaven comes down on that sacrifice, it manifestly is God at work. Or something I read recently, Gideon, you know the story of Gideon? Had a, had a, well, he had a relatively big army, 32-odd thousand. He was going to go to that army, with the army against the Midianites. But the Lord reduced that army to less than 1% of its size. Against the countless Midianites who couldn't even be counted, God reduces them to 300. Why? So that the display of his glory is all the greater. So that he is magnified, his glory is magnified. And so that's what's going on here. Jesus doesn't set out to go to Bethany until Lazarus has died. Verse 12. The disciples said, uh, sorry, at the beginning of verse 12. No, I don't mean verse 12, do I? Verse 11. After saying these things, Jesus said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. Verses 14 and 15. 
Then Jesus told them plainly, because he'd been speaking figuratively about Jesus, uh, Lazarus' death. Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I'm glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Now do you see that Jesus there, verse 15, said that he was glad that he wasn't there? Why? Because if he was there, he'd have done a healing. He'd have healed Lazarus. He'd have made Lazarus better. But he was glad he wasn't there while Lazarus was still alive. He holds back even leaving to go to Bethany until Lazarus has died. So that the faith of his disciples would be all the greater, would be built up in a way that it otherwise wouldn't have been the case. So Jesus delayed so that Martha and Mary and the disciples and the crowd saw not a healing but a raising. They saw Jesus' power not just over disease but over death. And surely afterwards, Martha and Mary not only understood Jesus' delay, but they thanked him for it. They were glad for it. They wouldn't have wanted it any other way. Let me draw two things out of application from this for, for believers. Firstly, Jesus' top priority for those whom he loves is the building of our faith in him. It's the growth of our delight in him. It's the increase of our hearts glorying in him. That's what he knows is what we most need. And that's his top priority. And if temporarily difficult circumstances might increase that in us, then he'll do that. He'll do that out of love for us. Now that's so helpful to know in the midst of painful circumstances, isn't it? Does the love of Jesus feel remote for you? Do you get up in the morning thinking, I've got another day of coping with all my burdens. Where's the love of Jesus in this? You can feel like that, can't it? But the answer of that passage is giving is that the love of Jesus is there active, even in your difficult circumstances. Causing even your circumstances so that it results in the greater glorying of your heart in him. That's the common experience of the Lord's people. Common experiences, painful circumstances through which God works good. Romans 8, that famous verse, isn't it? Romans 8, 28. It's true. That's why, that's why God brings these things into the lives of those he loves. He does it out of love so that we witness his power and goodness and glory in Christ in a way that we would not otherwise have done. And secondly, in, 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 in application to this point, One day we will fully understand. You know, life might be a fog at the moment. You might hear this and think, well, the love of Jesus is now okay, but I still am struggling. But the point is that one day we will look back on our circumstances and we will understand. And not just that, we will be glad for how the Lord has dealt with us. Do you remember Mary's outpouring that's coming up in chapter 12? Any sense there when Mary pours out that ointment, I wish you hadn't delayed, Jesus? None at all is there. She is just absolutely floored by the love of her Savior. It overwhelms her. She has nothing but thanksgiving and glorying in Christ for what he's done for her. And so it will be for us. When we see the loving reasons, when we look back, I mean, it may, it's not going to be like two days for us, will it? It may be the end of, end of a long life, a long period of time where we have temporarily gone through difficult things as believers. But nonetheless... The prospect is held out for us there. One day we will look back, we'll look back on our lives and see see God's love, God's providential dealing with us. And we will thank God for the way that even in through painful circumstances, he's loved us and, and the glorying of our hearts will be all the greater for it. And there'll be no sense of, I wish you hadn't done that. No, thank you, Lord. My heart overflows that you did this, as Mary's did. Now, there's a second unexpected display of the Lord Jesus' love in our passage. Verses 34 to 36. And Jesus said to them, Where have you laid him? Where have you laid Lazarus? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. So we've noted that Jesus' love is observed in verse 36. And it's because of verse 35. And verse 35 is precious, isn't it? It rightly shows Jesus' love for Lazarus. Those tears that Jesus weeps at Lazarus' tomb. And yet, isn't it curious? Jesus is just about to raise Lazarus. 
in roughly 10 minutes' time, there won't be anything to weep about, as it were. And Jesus has known from the start that he'll do that. End of verse 11. It's clear that Jesus has known he's going to wake Lazarus. He's going to resurrect Lazarus. There's no surprise here. So why is Jesus weeping just before he does so? Well, if we add into the mix some other verses about Jesus' emotions in this passage, uh, it, it, the, the uh, curiosity increases, I think. Verse 33. Verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping, saw Lazarus' sister weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Now, if you've got an, uh, an ESV there, you'll see a little footnote after deeply moved. And down at the bottom of the page, it'll tell you that was indignant is an alternative translation, and in fact, a more accurate translation. Was indignant. Jesus was indignant. I mean, get the same word in verse 38. Then Jesus deeply moved again, indignant again, came to the tomb. So why is this? What's going on here with Jesus' emotions in this passage? What's, what's to be understood from this? Well, isn't it this? As Jesus looks on this scene, he is seeing, he is seeing so manifestly the world as it's not meant to be. He's seeing a broken world. He is seeing his own creation, John chapter 1, verse 3. He made, all things were made through him. Creation was made through him. And he's seeing it utterly broken in pieces. He's seeing a grave with a body in. He's seeing mourners weeping. He's seeing a world like that. He's seeing loved ones like that. He sees the grief of, the, of his beloved disciples, Mary and Martha. He sees the tomb of his beloved disciple, Lazarus. And he, as it were, responds, an enemy has done this. I'm actually taking those words from Matthew chapter 13, verse 27. Uh, that, uh, a parable there Jesus tells. And, and in Jesus' words, he explains in, the, in that parable, an enemy has done this. An enemy has sown seeds in my world. An enemy has sown evil seeds in my world. And look at it. There it is. An enemy has done this. And you can see it is there. And so as Jesus is angry and indignant in this passage, might that not be because he's angry at the one who was a murderer from the beginning, as he says in chapter 8, verse 44? There's a cause to this. There's a cause to this death and carnage in the world. As Jesus surveys this scene of death and misery, mightn't it take his mind to the one who sowed the seed of death and misery in the world? The devil? The serpent, the ancient serpent in Genesis chapter 3. As Jesus sur surveys this scene, he knows he's looking at the devil's handiwork. But here's the glorious truth that 1 John chapter 3 verse 8 declares. The reason the Son of God appears was to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus surely weeps in this passage and even becomes indignant in this passage because he sees the work of his enemy against those whom he loves. That causes his indignation to rise. But Jesus came into the world for the very reason of going into battle against our enemy. And so Jesus' anger here in this passage is the anger of a warrior about to enter the fray on behalf of those he loves. It's the anger of a king, a loving king, going in, about to enter the fray on behalf of his subjects whom he loves. Now, you can see that sort of um, attitude, if you can see it, uh, describe it like that, uh, uh, of the, the anger of one who is going entering the fray on behalf of those he loves in various passages. You might like, if you want to this afternoon, to look at, for example, Psalm 18. You'll see it in Psalm 18, Psalm 1-8. It's quite a long psalm, but you see that there. The Lord coming in anger to rescue those he loves. You'll see it in Habakkuk chapter 3 as well. And there are probably other places as well, but you might like to look at one of those. Let me just show you this in the last third or so of the sermon. Let me show you the, the bigger picture of this passage, even than the miracle that takes place in the passage. We'll come back, God willing, to look at that another time. But the bigger picture of this passage is that Jesus is entering the fray, truly, in this passage. He is going to Bethany and by doing so precipitating events that will take him to the cross. That's the picture of this passage. That's the big picture. And that will free his own from Satan. Jesus is entering the fray. He's a warrior. He's a loving king going on behalf of his people in this passage. 
Earlier we considered how it seemed surprising that Jesus stayed put uh, when he heard about Lazarus being ill. But now, in fact, the, the disciples were astonished the other way. The disciples were astonished about Jesus going to Judea. You can see that verse 7 and 8. For Jesus to go to Judea was to go to where they wanted to kill him. And what we see in, is that Jesus' raising of Lazarus in Judea directly results in the chief priests and the Pharisees planning and plotting to put him to death. That's in verse 53 of chapter 11. The anointing of Jesus by Mary, the beginning of chapter 12, which is because of Jesus raising her brother, that's the anointing that takes place just six days before the Passover at which Jesus will be crucified. That's the anointing that the other Gospels tell us about without telling us that it's Lazarus' sister who did the anointing. It was Lazarus' sister. And in fact, we read in chapter 12, verse 10, that the chief priests made plans following from our passage, not just to put Jesus to death, but to put Lazarus to death as well. They're going to kill this man a second time. They're going to, they're going to die a second time. That's what they're hoping, planning. And the, part that the, uh, the crowd that went to meet Jesus on Palm Sunday, we find out in John's Gospel, they go out from Jerusalem because they are overwhelmed with what they've just seen Jesus do in Lazarus' graveyard. Do you see this, this miracle of this passage is deeply intertwined with the events of Easter? In other words, as Jesus set out for Bethany, having delayed for two days out of love, as we've seen, he does so with gospel love in his heart. He does so in the same way that he came from heaven to earth. He does so full of grace, knowing it will take him shortly to the cross. He goes to enter the fray on, on behalf of his beloved, to go uh, on behalf of Martha and Mary and Lazarus and the eleven, and you and I who know and love him and believe in him, as they did, Jesus in this passage goes to wrest us from Satan's power. Goes to snatch us from the hand of the one who had the power of death over us. And he does so by giving himself sacrificially, loving us to the uttermost, as we see in chapter 13. Stooping to serve us, to wash us, to cleanse us, to bear our sin for us. For all the love then that Jesus shows in our passage in, La in going to, um, to the tomb of Lazarus, Jesus in the wider passage is showing even greater love by going to his own tomb, laying down his life for those he loves. Now I've preached this passage largely this morning for the benefit of believers here today, for you to glory in your Savior. And I pray it does so. I pray that something of this the love that Jesus shows in this passage, the heart by, uh, that sends him to Bethany uh, will, will sort of resonate with your heart and, and stir your heart and my heart so that we love him more ardently. It's a bit like the man in Mark 5, isn't it? He, he, he loves Jesus. He loves Jesus because of what Jesus did for him. Mary loves Jesus because of what he did for her. And I want us to go home filled with what Jesus has done for us. But it's also, as I close, it's also my privilege to preach this Saviour Jesus to non-believers too, of whom there may be, well be some here this morning. Because this Saviour Jesus that we've been thinking about from this passage is everything you need and everything you could want. He came to be the Saviour of the world. He came to be the Saviour not just of a few, not just of the ones and twos, the, the family in Bethany, the 11 disciples. No, he came, he came to be the saviour of the world, we find out earlier in John's Gospel. He came to save people from every nation, every language. In fact, we find out that many believed in Jesus as a result of this miraculous sign he does in this passage. Chapter 12, verse 11. Many believed in him as a result of this. And so you too, if you're not a believer here this morning, may come to him and be received by him for your salvation. There's, there's a welcome for you too if you come to Christ. So have you seen something of Jesus' power displayed in this passage? We haven't covered that much. We'll come back to more another time. Do you see something of his love in this passage? We've looked at that. Do you see Jesus' love in this passage? More than that, do you see your need of him? In this passage in verses, 10, uh, sorry, verses 7 to 10, 
when the disciples expressed concern that it was dangerous to go back to Judea, Jesus gives this curious answer in verses 7 to 10. And he answers them by warning them to make sure, basically, I think, that they don't walk in the darkness. Make sure that you don't have darkness in you, but have the light in you. Who's the light? Jesus is the light. In other words, the most important thing you need. You might think you've got worries in this world. You might think you've got dangers that you might face. The most important thing you need is the light of Christ in you. Jesus is the light. Jesus is the good news. Jesus is the saviour. Without him, we walk in darkness. The darkness of our sin. The darkness of perishing. The darkness of stumbling, as Jesus says there. Stumbling and perishing. Without Christ, you will die in your sin and face everlasting judgment. But Jesus came in love to redeem those who don't deserve it, to save, to wash, to cleanse from their sin and to give eternal life to all who will come to him. Jesus calls all who are thirsty, in other words, everyone who wants him and his salvation to come to him. Jesus promises he will never cast out any who will come to him. And so, will you not come to him and receive him humbly and repentantly and ultimately overflowing with thanksgiving. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we've seen something of the beautiful love of the Lord Jesus Christ for those he came to save in this passage. We see the surprising love of him delaying so that his disciples will see a greater display of his glory and and their hearts will be filled to a greater degree with overflowing. Oh, Heavenly Father, may this be the experience of us here. May this be the common experience of every person here gathered this morning, every person listening online. Some will have already experienced this. They'll have come to Christ for salvation and they'll have experienced a measure of of love for him in our hearts. Increase that for those whom that is the case. Increase our love for Christ. May our love be poured out like ointment on him as we see more gloriously the love of our Saviour. And for those who have not yet come to know this redeeming love of Jesus for themselves, how would you pour out your spirit in their hearts and cause them to turn to Christ with all their heart and soul and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, the love of Christ, the dimensions of which cannot be measured. So we pray these things for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. Let's uh, finish our time together this morning with our final song then. Crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne. Let's stand and sing.
Heavenly Father, we think of that never-failing praise of Jesus that will go up for all eternity. We see a glimpse of it in Martha and Mary. We see a glimpse of it in the man uh, uh, healed of the demons. Uh, may that be our experience. Or may there be growth in the grace and knowledge of our Saviour. We pray in his name. Amen. Please do sit down. And... Uh, Please do stay behind for drinks. They'll be served shortly in the foyer. Thanks.